Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Siobhan McDonough. Uh, question number one, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Siobhan McDonough. Uh, Mr Speaker, Nilak is seven and he has autism. He desperately needs security and routine. But high London rents and insecure tenancies mean that he and his devoted family have moved four times in 18 months. As a result, he has had a breakdown and been admitted to hospital. Can I ask the Prime Minister if he agrees that insecure six-month private tenancies are no place for a family with children, and particularly not children with autism? I agree with the Honourable Lady how important it is that people do have security, particularly when you're looking after disabled children and you need that help. That's why we've been encouraging longer-term tenancies alongside the standard six-month tenancies, and we want to see those developed in the market. Mr Robert Jenrick. Thank you, Mr Speaker. First, they tried to... First, they sold our gold reserves at a record low. And then they tried to fr- freeze our energy prices at a record high. Doesn't this latest display of economic illiteracy confirm that only this government can prevent us to be blunt? James Blunt. James Blunt returning back to Bedlam. Well, I think I. Um I think I caught some of that, though I may need to buy the album to uh, get the rest of it. But the point is a good one. The opposition's policy of freezing energy prices at the top of the market would be denying the price cuts that are now coming through the customers around this country. But the key to all of this is to stick to our long-term economic plan, which again today is seeing unemployment fall, the number of people in work rise to record levels, something which I'm sure will get a welcome right across the House of Commons. Ed Miliband. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, let me start by saying, first of all, on the Iraq inquiry, for my part, that it was set up six years ago, and I agree with the Prime Minister, it should be published as soon as possible. Now, now on the economy, as the election approaches, can the Prime Minister confirm that we now know this will be the first government since the 1920s to leave office with living standards lower at the end of the Parliament than they were at the beginning? Well, Well, first of all, let me agree with the Leader of the Opposition that we want to see this Iraq inquiry published promptly. But let me make this point. If everyone in this House, including members opposite, had voted to set up the Iraq inquiry when we proposed, it would have been published years ago. So perhaps perhaps he could start by recognising his own regret at voting against the establishment of the inquiry. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker the, inquiry, the inquiry was established six the inquiry was established six years ago after our combat operations had ended. And frankly, my views on the Iraq war are well known and I want this inquiry published. Now I notice he didn't I notice he didn't answer on the economy. He didn't answer on the economy. Families are sixteen hundred pounds a year worse off. He said in his 2010 manifesto living standards would rise. Can we therefore agree that Tory manifesto promises on living standards aren't worth the paper they're written on? First of all, let's be clear, he voted again and again and again against establishing the inquiry. But as ever, absolutely no apology. Now let me deal very directly with living standards and what is happening in the economy of our country. The news out today shows a record number of people in work, a record number of women in work. We are seeing wages growing ahead of inflation, and we're also seeing disposable income now higher than any year that was under the last Labour government. As for his figure of £1,600, it doesn't include any of the tax reductions that we have put in place again and again under this government. That is the truth. 
And the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, he told us there'd be no growth. We've had growth. He told us there'd be no jobs. We've had jobs. He told us there'd be a cost of living crisis. We got inflation at 0.5%. He's wrong about everything. He's raised taxes on ordinary families. He's raised VAT. He's cut tax credits. The reality is that people are worse off on wages and they're worse off on taxes under this Prime Minister. Now, now, he thinks everything is hunky-dory. Did he even notice this week the report that came out that said half of all families where one person is in full-time work can't make ends meet at the end of the month? You can work hard, play by the rules, but in Cameron's Britain you still can't pay the bills. That's the reality. I, I study every report that came out. He's referring, of course, to the Roundtree report. And the Roundtree report says this. The risk of falling below a socially acceptable living standard decreases as the amount of work in a household increases. And under this government, we've got over 30 million people in work. We've got the lowest rate of young people claiming unemployment benefit since the 1970s. Long-term unemployment is down. Women's unemployment is down. We're getting the country back to work. And in terms of living standards, we've raised to £10,000 the amount of money people can earn before they start paying taxes. And people who are in work are seeing their pay go up by 4%. But if we'd listened to the right honourable gentleman, none of these things would have happened. If we listened to them, it would be more borrowing, more spending, more debt, all the things that got us in a mess in the first place. Speaker, he is the person who has failed on the deficit. And, and this Prime Minister... And this Prime Minister, and this Prime Minister says, this, this Prime Minister Order. never had it so good, and he's totally wrong. Now he doesn't notice. He doesn't notice what's going on because life's good for those at the top. Can he confirm that while everyday people are worse off, executive earnings have gone up 21 per cent in the last year alone? Prime Minister. He criticises me on the deficit. He's the man who couldn't even remember the deficit. And also, he's now had four questions and not a single word of welcome for the unemployment figures out today. Behind every single one of those statistics is a family that with someone who can go out to work, who can earn a wage, who can help give that family security. We are the party that is putting the country back to work. Labour are the party that would put it all at risk. Total complacency about one month's figures when he's had five years of failure under this government. Now, under him, we're a country of food banks and bank bonuses, a country of tax cuts for millionaires while millions are paying more. Isn't his biggest broken promise of all that we're all in it together? Yeah. Oh, dearie me. You can see the problem that Labour have got. They can't talk about the deficit because it's coming down. They can't talk about employment because it's going up. They can't talk about the economy because the IMF, the President of the United States, all say the British economy is performing well. So what are they left with? Well, I'll tell you, Mr Speaker, they've got an energy policy to keep prices high. They've got a minimum wage policy that would cut the minimum wage. And they've got a homes tax that has done the impossible and unite the Honourable Member for Hackney with Peter Mandelson. Now, to be fair, to be fair to the honourable gentleman, we we learnt at the weekend. We learnt at the weekend what he could achieve in one week in Doncaster, where he couldn't open the door. He was bullied by small children, and he set the carpet on fire. Just imagine what a shambles he'd make of running the country. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is a prime minister. This is a Prime Minister denying... Order. It may well be the session will take a bit longer, but questions and answers... That's fine. That's fine by me. But however long it takes, the questions and the answers will be heard. Ed Miliband. I've got to say to the Prime Minister, if he's so confident about leadership, why is he chickening out of the TV election debate? Prime Minister, who will go down in history as the worst on living standards for working people. He tells people they're better off, they know they're worse off. Working families know they can't afford another five years of this government. 
please. Why don't we, Mr Speaker, leave the last word to the head of the IMF, who often quoted by the Shadow Chancellor, who today seems to be having a quiet day, and I can see why, because our economy is growing, people are getting back to work. She said this, the UK, where clearly growth is improving, the deficit has been reduced, where unemployment is going down, certainly from a global perspective, this is exactly the sort of result we'd like to see. More growth, less unemployment, a growth that is more inclusive, that is better shared, a growth that is sustainable and balanced. That is the truth. Every day this country is getting stronger and more secure, and every day we see a Labour Party weaker and more divided and more unfit for office. Does uh, my right honourable friend fully recognise the contrast in efficiency uh, between the inquiries into the Crimean War <laughs> and, and uh, the Dardanelles campaign? But when compared with the uh, disgraceful incompetence of uh, the Chilcot inquiry into widely held suspicions that Mr Blair conspired with President George W. Bush several months before March of 2003 and then systematically, systematically sought to falsify the evidence on which that action was taken. Well, I, I um, obviously bow to the Father of the House's knowledge about these, these previous inquiries. I, I would say the, the one thing all three have in common is I'm not responsible for the timing of, uh, of any of them. The truth is it is extremely frustrating that this report cannot come out more quickly, but the responsibility lies squarely with the inquiry team. It is an independent inquiry. It would not be right for the Prime Minister to try and interfere with that inquiry, but I feel sure when the inquiry does come out, it will be thorough and it will be comprehensive. But let me repeat again. If the Labour Party had voted for this inquiry when we first put it forward, the inquiry would be out by now. Mark Reckless. The, <laughs> the, the deputy, the deputy <laughs> prime minister, the deputy <laughs> prime minister, dared to debate <laughs> Nigel Farage. <laughs> Why won't the prime minister? <laughs> I, I, I've made my views very clear. If we're going to have uh, one minor party, we should have all the minor parties. Uh, but but and, 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 uh, and when this happens, one point I will be making is what he said, Mr Farage, in 2012 about the NHS, and the Honourable Gentleman comes to this House week after week to talk about the NHS in Kent. Well, Mr Farage said this, we're going to have to move to an insurance-based system of health care. That is the UKIP policy, privatise the NHS. I say never. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Around about an estimated 13 million people, 30% of those who should be eligible to vote, are either incorrectly or not registered at all on the individual electoral registration system. In this year of the election, will the Prime Minister ensure that the government fully supports the National Voter Registration Day on the 5th of February, and will he commit himself to taking part in the Bite the Ballot leadership live event? And it may help his decision to know that the Greens have agreed to take part in that debate. I think it is important that people register to vote, and that's why local authorities have been given over £7 million to help in that process. But I do think the individual voter registration will help to cut out some of the fraud and some of the uh, uh, systems that were used in previous elections. This is Mary Glyndon, 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. This week, Channel 4's dispatches did an excellent job in exposing the reality of life for millions of people in low-paid, part-time and insecure work. Can't the Prime Minister see that his failure to promote decent jobs with decent pay is still a fundamental problem for our economy? Say to the Honourable Lady is if she looks at the figures, she will see that eight out of ten of the jobs created in the last year are full time jobs. Now, I know the Labour Party comes here trying to make a case, but I'm afraid all the evidence has moved away from you. you. Originally, it was said no jobs would be created. We now see more people in work than ever in our history. Then we were told all the jobs would be part time. You can now see the majority are full time jobs. Then we were told the jobs wouldn't pay more than inflation and you can now see wages rising ahead of inflation. And, of course, helping that is the cuts in income tax that we've made to help people who are low paid and to take them out of uh, income tax altogether. That is the programme we're pursuing. There's not an ounce of complacency because there's a lot more work to do, but we are on the right track. Jessica Lee. Yeah. Yeah. anniversary of the signing of the Magna Carta. Will the Prime Minister support the Magna Carta Roadshow, a project I'm running in schools in Erewash, to make all children aware of this important document and, much import more importantly, about the constitutional history of our great country and the rights and freedoms that we hold so dear? Well, I absolutely join the Honourable Lady in making that point. This is an important anniversary and I think it's very important this country and our Parliament commemorates it properly and also so that we make sure we teach in schools uh, how our constitution has involved the rights that we have because pride in those things is very important for understanding the precious jewel that we have in having a functioning democracy under the rule of law. Mr. Andrew Gwynn. The target for a maximum two-month wait from urgent referral for suspected cancer to, f to first treatment for all cancers is being breached. Is there a bigger sign of his government's failure than his inability to uphold key rights for cancer patients that are enshrined in the NHS constitution? Yeah. Well, it's absolutely vitally important that cancer patients get urgent treatment. What we're seeing under this government is half a million more people getting referred for cancer uh, treatment, and that is why cancer survival rates are going up. But let me give him the figures for his own hospital um, area, where you've got 96.8% of patients with suspected cancer seen by a specialist within two weeks. That's an improvement since 2010. You've got 100% of patients diagnosed with cancer beginning treatments within 31 days. That's an improvement on 2010. And you've also got 94.8% of patients beginning cancer treatment within 62 days of a GP referral. That, again, is an improvement on 2010. The reason we're able to make these improvements is we put the resources into the NHS when the Labour Party told us that that was irresponsible. And we've also got rid of the bureaucracy in the NHS in England, which is why the NHS in England is performing better than the NHS in Wales. Sir Richard Ottaway. I, sh I share the Prime Minister's disappointment over the delay to the Chilcot report, particularly when you recall that the issue in 2009 was whether it would be published in time for the 2010 election, let alone the 2015 election. Will the Prime Minister agree that the invitation of the Foreign Affairs Committee to Sir John Chilcot to give evidence to the committee? not to point the finger of blame, but to give him a chance to explain the reasons for the delay to ensure that this situation never happens again. Yes. Well, obviously, my view is that when people are asked to appear in front of a select committee, when they're public servants, they should uh, try to meet that obligation. It's obviously a matter for the House and for the, his select committee how he uh, processes that. I think the most important thing right now uh, for um, Chilcott and his, his team is to get the report ready and to make sure it can be published as soon as possible after the election. Angela Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last summer, my constituent, Mr Kenneth Bailey, suffered a major stroke while out shopping. The emergency call was classed as Red 2 priority, and yet it took Yorkshire Ambulance Service an hour and four minutes to get to him. This is just one example of a crisis that is now nationwide. So can I ask, 
What is the Prime Minister going to do about this situation? Yeah. Well, what we're doing in terms of the ambulance service is making sure that there are the 1,700 extra paramedics. We put 50 million more into the ambulance service over the winter. But let me say I hope there's something which all sides of the House can unite over, which is it would be completely wrong for the ambulance strike that is proposed to go ahead next week. Now, I unreservedly condemn any attempts to go on strike and to threaten our services, particularly this time of heightened national uh, concern, and I hope members of the Labour Party, irrespective of which union they are sponsored by, will do the same thing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Leader of the Opposition won't. Will the Prime Minister welcome the IMF saying this week that Britain has the fastest growing advanced economy in the world? Will he welcome today's announcement that unemployment is falling in Dover and Deal and across Britain? And does he agree with President Obama that we must be doing something right? Yeah. Oh, well, I thought um, it was uh, very kind of the President of the United States to uh, make that point about doing something right. And the IMF are absolutely clear. I mean, what the IMF said is this. The UK is leading in a very eloquent and convincing way in the European Union. A few countries, but only a few, are driving growth. That is what they think about the British economy and about the American economy. Now, obviously, it's helping in Dover, where the claimant count is down by 28% since the election. But, frankly, we shouldn't be satisfied until everyone who wants a job in our country is able to get a job in our country, and until our our employment rate is the best in the G7, that is what I would define as achieving what we want, which is full employment in our country. Jamie Perkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, The Prime Minister's crisis in the National Health Service has its roots uh, in general practice. Uh, The changes this government made to GP pensions saw a huge number of uh, GPs retire early. Uh, and in my area in Chesterfield, 40% uh, of places on uh, future recruitment of GPs are left vacant. How can we expect that this country is going to recruit the number of GPs uh, that we need when so few of them have any confidence in his running of the National Health Service? Minister. Well, what the figures show is there are a thousand more GPs working in the NHS today than when I became Prime Minister. In his own area, there are 25 more GPs than in 2010. But, but, but I agree with him that we need further other changes to make sure uh, our GPs, our family doctor service works really well. We already see four million people having access to seven-day opening of of GP surgeries. I want to see that expanded to the whole of the country. Now, this is a step forward after a step back taken by the last Labour government that took GPs out of um, of our care altogether. Sir Bob Russell. The East of England helped boost the nation's economic recovery and we could do even more if the East Anglian Rail Manifesto was implemented. So will the Prime Minister encourage colleagues to fund this with modern rolling stock for the Greater Anglia mainline and infrastructure improvements through Essex? Minister, I I do want to see real improvements in the Greater Anglia service. He's right about the economy in the eastern region of our country, 224,000 more people in work compared to 2010. What the Chancellor said in the autumn statement is that we would provide the funding for the improved rolling stock. We want to achieve, as well as improvements in Essex, we want to help achieve the Norwich in 90 campaign, and we also want to see a service from Ipswich uh, that will get to London in under an hour. This will take investment, but that's part of our long-term economic plan. Diane Abbott. The delay in the publication of the Chilcot report is widely considered to be a scandal. Does the Prime Minister appreciate that it is important to find out exactly what has gone wrong because we have a major inquiry? into child sex abuse forthcoming, and the public would not understand if powerful people that may be named in that report would be able to delay publication year after year, as seems to have happened with Chilcot. I I agree with the Honourable Lady that that it is important these inquiries are done thoroughly and are done rapidly. Uh, My understanding is there is no mystery in why this is taking so long. It is a very thorough report, and you have to give the people who are criticised in a report the opportunity to respond 
respond to all those criticisms. That is what is happening at the moment. I don't believe, from what I understand, that anyone is trying to dodge this report or put off this report. We all want to see it. But you do have to go through the proper processes. Let me just make one other point clear. There's no question of this report being delivered to me and me deciding, myself deciding not to publish it in terms of the election. The whole report is not going to reach the Prime Minister's desk, whoever that is, uh, until after the election. Dame Angela Watkinson. Would the Prime Minister join me in congratulating Havering Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Havering Branch of Mind, who are coming together tomorrow evening in an event to promote employment opportunities for people with mental health problems? I I will certainly do that. I think it's right that mental health is getting a much higher political profile today than it has in the past. In terms of the National Health Service, we've given it parity of esteem in the NHS constitution. But my honourable friend is absolutely right that one of the key challenges is helping people with mental health conditions get into work. And there's a lot more that business can do by engaging with the charities to help people in in that situation. Mr David Winnick. As we know, next week it will be 70 years since Auschwitz was liberated by the Russians. And is it not important that when issues like Palestine are raised, and I have done so and will continue to do so, that should be no excuse for anti-Semitism, a murderous disease which took the lives of millions of innocent people, indeed, during my own lifetime. Let me say I agree 100 per cent with the Right Honourable Gentleman for everything that he said. Uh, Anyone who has been to Auschwitz, and I went recently, you cannot help but be struck by what an appalling end came of the hatred and the prejudice that was being fostered uh, across Europe, and the sight of all those children's clothes and toys and bags and human hair, those sights stay with you for a very, very long time after you've seen them. And I know this has all party support, that we make sure the Holocaust Commission that we've established uh, reports uh, soon, and we take that work forward, and we continue to make sure that young people in our schools are able to make uh, the harrowing but very, very powerful trip to see Auschwitz for themselves. Sir Mingus Campbell. May I tell my right honourable friend that as someone who voted with colleagues against the Iraq war, I have sought to follow the Chilcot inquiry very closely. May I tell them that I am aware of no evidence that any witness, any witness, has sought to alter the progress of the inquiry by delay. But I am aware that there are reports that there have been instances of illness among the members of the inquiry, and in one case severely so. But there is not the lesson to be learned from this after the experience of the Savile Inquiry and the Chilcot Inquiry that the proper template for such inquiries in the future should be as of Leveson, judge-led but with a strict timetable. I think um, my right honourable friend makes, uh, makes a very strong point, particularly from uh, the stance that he's taken, which, and I agree with him, that I've not heard anything that anyone is trying artificially to delay uh, this report. He's absolutely right about um, some of the things that have happened to the panel inquiry members, most notably the brilliant uh, biographer of Churchill, uh, Martin Gilbert, who I'm sure uh, best wishes from everyone across the House would, would go to. Um, but I think he makes a fair point that as inquiries are set up, we should give more thought to trying to make sure they are completed in very good time. Stephen Timms. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister said that his policies would eradicate the deficit in this Parliament. Unfortunately, he was mistaken. A very large deficit remains. What is the reason, in his view, why his economic plan has fallen so far short? Well, we inherited from Treasury ministers, including himself, uh, the biggest deficit of any country in the Western world. And as a share of GDP, we have cut that in half. Now, we've done that through a combination of reducing public spending, of making sure we have responsible tax policies and strong economic growth. That is what we've delivered. All the way through, the Labour Party's proposals have been for more spending, more borrowing and more debt. They haven't even got to base camp of working out why the deficit matters. The General Howard. As the member privileged to represent the home of the British Army in Aldershot, which I can 
I can tell the father of the house was established as a direct result of the inquiry into the Crimean War. <laughs> <laughs> and the failures thereof. May I ask my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, to reassure me that uh, press reports this morning that uh, there are uh, discussions about reducing uh, the regular army from the already low level of 82,000 to 60,000 are wholly unfounded, and so long as he remains Prime Minister, no such cuts will be contemplated. Prime Minister! I can absolutely give him that assurance. These ideas are absolutely not on the table, and as long as I'm Prime Minister, the regular army will stay at its current size. Yeah. Um, I'd like to start by I very much welcome the reduction in UK unemployment that's been announced this morning. I have to add, however, Mr Speaker, but that's not the case in my constituency, where unemployment has actually risen very slightly, which I'm sure the Prime Minister has in his notes in front of him. And for those who are in work, their wages, the value of their wages has dropped over the last year by 1.5%, whilst the Prime Minister's constituents' wages continue to rise above inflation. Is the Prime Minister proud under his watch the poor continue to be poorer and the rich keep getting richer? Yeah. What I'd say to the Honourable Lady, if you look at Scotland as a whole, on the year unemployment is down by 20,000, and the rate of unemployment in Scotland is also down. And actually, the rate the rate of unemployment in Scotland is lower than the rate of unemployment, for instance, in London. So the idea that this recovery is only being felt in the south of our country is simply nonsense. Now, she mentions the issue of wages. Obviously, one of the most powerful things we can do to help people with the cost of living is to take them out of income tax. And in Scotland, uh, we have taken 23,000 people out of income tax altogether, and over 2 million people are benefiting from the personal allowance changes that have already already help people to the tune of over £700 a year. Mr Glenn Davis. Um, Mr Speaker, the, uh, the dairy industry underpins the economy of rural Britain, including that of my constituency of Montgomeryshire. And the dairy industry is currently in difficulty. Now, does the Prime Minister accept that the government must consider all ways to bring stability to this important sector, including whether the powers of the grocery court adjudicator should be extended and strengthened. No, I, I very much agree with my honourable friend, and I think it is important that we look at how we can support Britain's dairy farmers at a time of very low milk prices. This is an important industry for our country, and I think there are a number of things we can do. First of all, make sure that uh, revenue are prepared to provide the time to pay support for our dairy farmers. I think there's more we can do in terms of leading exports for British food producers, and I know the Secretary of State is very keen on that, specifically on the grocery code adjudicator, something we have established. I think it is time to make sure that organisation has the power, if necessary, to levy fines so that it can get its will obeyed. And I also think it's time to look at whether there are ways in which its remit can be extended to make sure it looks at more of this vital Emma industry. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Western Bartonshire desperately needs a pay rise. A quarter of our children are living in poverty, and this Prime Minister's policies are failing them and their families. A year ago, the Chancellor suggested that he wanted to see a £7 national minimum wage from this October. So, will the Prime Minister tell me why his government's evidence to the Low Pay Commission makes no mention of this at all? Our evidence to the Low Pay Commission says we need another increase in the minimum wage. And it's only under this government that we've seen a minimum wage increase ahead of inflation, which never happened while Labour were presiding over economic chaos. That's the truth. But let me, let me, let me explain to the Honourable Lady. She is going to have to explain to her constituents why Labour's minimum wage policy would actually cut the minimum wage in the next Parliament. That is how incompetent and useless her front bench are. The best the best thing we can do is keep growing the economy, keep creating jobs, keep cutting taxes, because we're on track and the plan is working. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. 
there's been a spate of dog thefts across the Bradford district and a rally was held in Bradford to bring attention to the uh, people about Murphy, a husky who was stolen recently. This is very distressing for the owners and the dogs concerned, both of which are devoted to each other. Some of these dogs are used for practice for dog fighting and who knows what fate awaits some of the other dogs that are stolen. Will the Prime Minister use his good officers to draw attention to this problem and make sure the authorities investigate these crimes as, and take them as seriously as any other crime. No, but I, think, I think my uh, honourable friend makes an important point, which is that we are a nation of dog lovers. People are very attached to their pets and it's appalling when they get stolen, particularly for the sort of purposes uh, that my honourable friend talks about. Obviously the changes we've made in terms of compulsory chipping should help with this issue, but my heart goes out to anyone who's seen a much-loved pet taken away from them. Last but not least, Mr Nigel Dodds. Mr Speaker, um, as, the Prime Minister, as the Prime Minister looks back over his achievements as Prime Minister in the last five years uh, and what he, what he might be doing in the first few months of the next Parliament or might not be doing, would he accept that in order to keep this country strong at home and abroad, and further to the question that was asked by the Right Honourable Gentleman from Aldershot, will he commit to maintain defence spending? at 2% of GDP in order to ensure that our commitments to our NATO allies are maintained and that our country is secured. Well, we are one of the few NATO countries that does achieve 2% of spending on defence, and because of that, you're going to see in the coming months and in the coming years a defence equipment programme, which I think is second to none in Europe. Two aircraft carriers, new joint strike fighters, hunter killer submarines, the new frigates. You can see a really strong defence industry supported by the commitment we've made that the defence equipment programme specifically should be protected. Order.